Okay, this sermon's entitled Voracious Worship. I'd like to open up with prayer and then with a few verses. All right, dear God, thank you for giving us your clear word. Thank you for allowing us to see what it says. Bless the listeners. I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now let's open up with Psalm 61. It reads, Hear my cry, O God, attend unto my prayer. From the end of the earth will I cry unto thee. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For thou hast been a shelter for me and a strong tower from the enemy. Now, one reason why we should worship God is because, number one, he is higher than we are. He is greater than we are. And he is worthy of our praise and worship. Number two, he has saved us by his grace. So this sermon's for believers only. The unsaved has no reason to worship God. And there are examples of unsaved people worshiping God. I'm going to get into that in a minute here. But that's not true worship. So let's take a look at a few verses that talk about worship. And let's see what the Bible has to say about this. Let's turn over to Deuteronomy, or turn back to Deuteronomy chapter 29. We'll start from the Old Testament and work our way up. Deuteronomy chapter 29, and let's take a look at verse 18. It reads, it says, Lest there should be among you men, or, or, or woman, or family, or tribe, whose heart turneth away this day from the Lord our God, to go and serve the gods of these nations, lest there should be among you a root that beareth gall and wormwood. What we learn from this is that whenever we worship God, it's got to be exclusive. We have to be, we basically need to put, put aside everything else. And we need, we need to be focusing on God alone. And we're going to see more about that later on. Now turn over to 1 Samuel chapter 15. 1 Samuel chapter 15. And let's take a look at verse uh, 22. It reads, 1 Samuel chapter 15, hang on. It says, And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the word of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than to sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. Now, God wants us to worship him, no doubt, but he also wants us to obey his word and to listen to his word. That's why if, if you're in a church where they're preaching wrong, that's not going to be true worship. Because these are people that are not listening to the Bible. Anytime a person's believing wrong, it's because they're not listening to the, to the Word of God. They have, re, they have disregarded it. They have rejected it. So now, let's take a look at one more verse that talks about worship. And then I'm going to get into some verses that talk about false worship. And then we're going to talk about voracious worship as well. So turn over to Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter number 14. Let's take a look at verse 7. It reads... It says, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him worship Him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. Now this, tell, this tells us to give God glory. That's what worshiping is. You're giving God all the credit. Now, it also lets us know what else God has done. Now, he's also he saved us by grace. He's also you know, responsible for creating the, everything. So that's why he's worthy of our praise, because we wouldn't even be here without God. So now let's turn to Mark chapter 7, and let's look at a few examples of, you know, false converts worshiping, or people that are trusting in a work salvation, and that's not going to be real worship. That's going to be worship in vain. Mark chapter 7, let's start off with verse um, 6. It reads, verse 6 reads, it says, He answered and said unto them, well hath Isaiah you know, prophesied of you hypocrites. As it is written, the people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Now, think about it. Anytime a person is trusting in their works to save them, or they've got faith plus works, or Christ plus works, now, would you really even think that there would be a need to worship God if that's the case? No. If a person is trusting in themselves, they would worship themselves. So that's what well, that's what it's talking about when it says they worship, you know, him in vain. Basically, they're they're giving lip service, but their heart is far from me. Now look at the next verse. How be it in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. So people are tell, teaching that you got to obey the commandments and whatnot, instead of that salvation's all by grace. It says this type of worship is in vain. When people believe you can lose your salvation, I don't care if they gyrate around in circles. I don't care if they you know worship God in a very Terpsichorean manner or whatever, I don't really care. Okay? It's all in vain. It's all garbage. It's all stupidity. That if they don't believe correct, it's not correct worship. Period. So now turn over to John chapter 4. John chapter 4. We see another example of this. 
It says in verse 20, Our fathers worshipped in this mountain. And ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus saith unto her, Okay, woman, believe me, the hour cometh... When ye shall neither in this mountain, nor yet at Jerusalem, worship the Father, ye worship ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now, what this tells us is that God wants us to worship him. And he says there's only one way to do it. You have to be doing it in spirit and in truth. In other words, you have to have the Holy Spirit to worship him in spirit. And all believers in Christ do have the Holy Spirit, but you have to worship him in truth. You have to be believing correct things about God. You can't believe in all this false doctrine and then call that worship. And it's all a bunch of baloney. See, what the devil is doing, he's trying to get people deceived. And he, he gets a bunch of mixed up people that are soteriologically mixed up. And they don't understand anything about you know the Bible, anything about salvation, and then, then he gets them to start worshiping God and to, to put on a bunch of fanfare and to make a big show, and that's all a deception because people see that and they think, well, these people must be the real, this must be, you know, the real deal. This must be what real, what real Christianity is. This must be an exemplification or an epitomization of real Christians, and it's not. It's garbage. If it's not in spirit and it's not in truth, it's not real worship. So that's why people need to be believing correctly. Now, let's take a look at some verses that talk about the name of God and why that name is so important in worship. Turn back to Psalm 86. Psalm 86, it reads in verse 9, and another thing we can, we can kind of you know, pick up from this in John 4 is that it doesn't matter where you worship God. What matters is that you're worshiping, worshiping him in truth and in spirit. So I think that's another point that we, we, need, to, we need to see from that. Worship is not correct. The venue is um, it's immaterial and it's insignificant. The bottom line is that God wants us to worship him anywhere in spirit and in truth. So now let's take a look at Psalm 86. Psalm 86, it reads in verse 9. It reads, All nations whom thou hast made shall come and worship before thee, O Lord, and shall glorify thee thy name. Now look at that. God wants us to glorify his name, okay, for what he has done, what he has done for us. So the name is very important. The name of Jesus is very important. We see, you know, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. We see in 1 John 5, 13, it talks about believing on the name of, of Christ. Then, in, of course, Acts chapter 4, verse 12, neither is there salvation in any, in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. So the name is very important. So jump back to Psalm 86 and look at verse 10. Okay, it's it, we just got done reading, O Lord and shall glorify thy name, for thou art great, and doest wondrous things, thou art God alone. So that tells us right there that God alone deserves our worship. And worship is not just limited to music. It's not just limited to praise. It can be, you know, preaching a sermon. It could be evangelizing. It could be anything. So now let's take a look at another verse that exalts the name of God. Let's turn back to Nehemiah chapter 9. Nehemiah chapter 9, and then we're going to look at a few verses that make it clear. If, if, if Christians do not worship God, you know, that the mountains and the rocks will. That's why we should start worshiping God, because if you don't, then you have basically inanimate objects. I mean, God created them, of course, but they're not alive. They don't have any life. They're insentient, and, and if, if we're going to let them worship God, then that's pretty bad. When we you know, are created in God's own image, and he wants us to worship him as well. So let's take a look at a verse that talks about the name of God. Turn back to Nehemiah chapter 9. We're going to skip the first part of the verse. We're going to skip all these names. You know, then the Levites, Jeshua, Cadmiel. We're going to skip all that, okay, for the sake of pronunciation. But look, look what it says in the middle of the verse. Stand up and bless the Lord your God forever and ever, and blessed be thy glorious name, which is exalted above all blessing and praise. So worship, you know, praise and worship is great. But if the name of God's not being exalted, then it's it's not it's it's basically in vain, because all the all the, the blessing and praise in the world is nothing compared to to the name of God. And it says that His name is a glorious name, and it's it's exalted above above everything else. 
So that's what the Bible teaches about how we should worship. It needs to be in truth. It needs to be based on what God has done. And people need to be believing correct. And they need to be believing the same. And that's very important. Now, if we don't worship God, the Bible says that the mountains and the rocks will. And that's why every creature that, that God has created should be worshiping God. And so let's turn over to Luke chapter 19, and let's take a look at a couple verses that talk about this. Look at verse 38. It says, saying, Blessed be the king that cometh in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven, and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. And he answered and said unto them, I tell you that, if these should hold their peace, and the word, the, the, when it says hold your peace, that means to keep quiet, or to keep silent. It says, the stones would immediately cry out. So if we don't worship God, the stones will. Now, turn over to uh, Psalm 66. Let's take a look at another verse that talks about this. Psalm 66, it reads, let's start off with verse 1 and we'll stop it with verse 4. It reads, make a joyful noise unto God, all ye lands. And that's one way to worship God, it's just making a joyful noise. You know, you're, you're praising God for what he has done. And that's why it's, it's good to sing the classic hymns, because most of the classic hymns are, are biblically sound, and they give God you know, praise and glory. So he's giving us kind of an outline here. Sing forth the honor of his name, make his praise glorious. Say unto God, how terrible art thou in thy works. You know, through the greatness of thy power shall thine enemies submit themselves unto thee. Now look at this. All the earth shall worship thee. I believe this is encompassing every, everything. Now, let's go to the verse where it actually talks about, like, you know, the trees and other creatures worshiping God. Turn over to Isaiah, chapter number 55. Isaiah, chapter 55. Let's take a look at what it says in verse, uh, verses 11 and 12. It reads, So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth, it shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. Now look at this. For ye shall go out with joy, and be led forth with, with peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth before you in singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Now what this is telling us is that this is an example of you know things that God has created, worshiping him. Okay? Now... We should be doing this because, number one, this was an anthropomorphism, obviously. They, obviously, trees cannot clap their hands. But it's, like I said, it's an anthropomorphism. This is giving us an example of how we should be worshiping God. We should be praising God. We should clap our hands, you know, to song and, and uh, spiritual songs and whatnot. So now, turn back to Psalm 150. And let's go over, a pa- you know, a chapter that basically just describes worshiping God. And once again, if a person is not saved, they need to get saved. And you're saved by trusting Jesus Christ alone. He died on the cross for your sins. He was buried and then he rose again. And he shed his blood for the sins of the whole world. And once you, the moment you believe on him alone for salvation, you're saved forever. And the Bible says in John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now that's a reason why we should worship God. And once we're saved, we're always saved. If you could lose your salvation or you could forfeit your salvation or somehow not be saved in the future, then there'd be, there would be no reason to worship God at all. Okay? But see, because we are eternally secure, because we, we are eternally and forever saved, we should worship God because our sins have all been removed. And we're going to heaven based on what Jesus Christ has done for us. So that we need to understand that we have the right to worship God because we are saved. The unsaved and the mixed up, they, they, don't, they can't worship God. It would all be in vain because, number one, it wouldn't be God alone that, that, did, that, did, that, that, that saved. And if it's not God alone that saves, then you have no right to worship him. So that's why we need to understand that worshiping God is for the saved. And Psalm gives us, gives us an example of how to worship God. It says, Praise ye the Lord... Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in the firmament of his power. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the psaltery and harp. Praise him with the timbrel and dance. Praise him with the stringed instruments and organs. Praise him upon the loud cymbals. Praise him upon the high sounding cymbals. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. Now, like I said, true voracious worship needs to be based on what God has done, who God is, 
and believing correctly about God. And that's worshiping him in spirit and in truth. People that are believing wrong, or they don't know what they believe, it's all in vain. It's all, it's all a show. It's all a spectacle. Okay? It's all about you know just drumming up attention. And that's not true worship. Because worship should be about what God has done alone. It's, it's all about him. It's not about us. So we see an outline right there. We, we can praise him with, with instruments. These phony, baloney, false, I don't know what you'd call them, false brethren that say the, it, it can't, you can't have instruments, that's garbage. Because instruments are used right there, and we see that these are examples of you know, people worshiping and praising God. And God has given us instruments, so we can use instruments, and, and that's what the Bible teaches. So the bottom line is that we worship God out of appreciation for what he has done for us, and we do it because he's worthy of our praise, and that's why the Bible has so much to say about worship. That's all I have. Dear God, thank you for giving us your clear word. Thank you for allowing us to see what it says on on this very important subject. Bless the listeners, I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.